um, it was fun to get out and uh, yeah. see it. So see those ponds. Yeah, I'm jealous for sure. <laughs> it was a nice day too. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've been having weird Hi, weather. Steph. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, Steph, Robert, Robert, Steph. Hey, Robert. Thanks nice for being here. Nice to meet you, Steph. Today. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, it's my <laughs> pleasure. Um, all right, Sean. It looks like you're recording already and everything's going smoothly. Well, <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Do you notice, am I lagging or is my internet slow at all? No, you seem really fine to me. Okay. Maybe it's okay. on my end. Hey, there's, Robert is a hair slow on my end, but it's not that big of a deal. Sean, that's just because you know me. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> I know everything. <laughs> um, a hair slow. It's a Friday afternoon. Give me a break. <laughs> it's, it's, it's happy hour time. <laughs> that's great oh my gosh um, Steph, before i forget i have a couple yeah. couple questions for you um for our our bonfire campaign the shirts mm -hmm. who did the art jackie did that's right okay that's what i thought jackie did the art yeah um and then for the uh committees if anyone's interested by chance that is on the on the call on our yeah uh, Zoom call, who should they contact if they want to get more information. They should contact Jamie, our secretary, uh, at okay. our like standard email address that you can find on the website. Um, and then I can plug it in the chat if you want. When you okay. Um, Jamie, our secretary at, um, at the website, at, at, uh, and her email is on our website or in the chat yep. that you'll, cool. And then I'll throw it in there really fast. Okay. I'm just gonna put it in there right now, so it's already there. How is it Friday already this week? Holy smokes. Right? That's crazy. Mm. Oh, tell you what, let me um, try sharing my screen. Oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. and, uh... Okay, so the host disabled participant sharing, so. You gotta grant me some permissions. My host? My host? You probably are. I am host. I need to grant you. Um... Yeah, I think there should be a little carrot on this share screen down in the bottom. I think that's oh, how you do go. it. Oh, wait. Uh, host disabled screen sharing. Wait, I'm the host, or maybe Stephanie's the host. Maybe Stephanie needs to update it since hey. she created the Zoom link. I think you're the host. I'm the um, host. Maybe I'm the. Maybe I can make somebody the host. No, I think you're the host. Um, Weird. When I press it, it says host disabled. Oh, host disabled go. participant screen sharing. I got it. I'm the host. Oh, here's here we go. Here we go. I I'm got you. Both of you co-hosts. So now both of you should be able to share your screen. Yeah. I, awesome. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why that took me a million years. I've zoomed. <laughs> I've zoomed every every Friday for the past year with my family because they're spread all over the place, and yeah. we've done it almost every single year, all, every single Friday. And I'm the host. I'm the host of Zoom and. I've shared, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've gone through this process before of making sure everyone can share stuff. That's I mean, so great. It's a, a uh, 
It sounds like brain a fart. Um, so what happens? As soon yeah. as you have to do it in front of people, then all of a sudden it falls apart. Like yeah, being in front of somebody. Okay. I need um, to find the invite. Can you? I can that looks great? Um, so what I'm seeing though is also your next animation. Um, oh. I see the slide and I also see the slide that it's going to advance to. And so um, I think maybe- Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Let's see. Trying to go into presenter view would be better unless that is in presenter view. Yeah, so I have two monitors. So that mm -hmm. was it selecting the wrong monitor to, <laughs> to yeah. share. Um, are you seeing my background here? Um, yeah, I sure am. Or do you- I see the background and I okay. see- um, your PowerPoint app. Oh, let's see. I see it all. So are you looking at the presenter yeah. view? Now I'm just looking at presenter view. This looks great. Oh, sorry. So that was okay? That was fine. And now it's no longer fine. <laughs> okay, was, so now we're good? No, now we're not good. Now we're good. Uh, now Maybe we're good. Lagging a little bit. Yeah, now it looks fine. Do you want to advance through a couple of slides? Yeah, that looks totally fine. Awesome. God, look at uh, that beauty. I just smile. want to try one more thing. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, the video. Oh, yeah, good idea. Um, there's a way. Of course, I just blew by it. Your screen to like, if you go into advanced sharing options. Oh, wait, hold on. That's not you. Um, when you share your screen in the future, are you going to use sound at all? Um, no, no. Okay, great. That that's sound. fine. It'll that's just be me watching. narrating on, on top of it. Cool. That's much easier. There's like a way, I'm sure you've done it, to like um, maximize your sound quality for videos. But if you're not going to deal with sound quality, then that's not a problem. Yeah, it shouldn't be. Well, cool. this looks great. Thanks. Awesome. Um, it looks like we have a couple of people funneling in, which is great. Um, we have like five more minutes, so I'm going to mute myself and stop my video and kind of prep for everybody to funnel in, but I'm here still. So if you need anything, um, let me know. I'm just going to be shuffling paperwork in the background. Cool. Cool. Thanks, yeah. yeah, no problem. Hey guys, I'm here. I just wanted to uh, let you know I'm here, but I'm driving, hey Jackie. so I will <laughs> Hey, Nice background. It's so a, um, it's a I'm bond. gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get my booty home so I can participate in the the CTS part, the drinking part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, how long but will I'm, you uh, will it take to get get back on? About oh, I'm gonna stay on. I'm oh. just leaving it on my car. So okay. I will, um, I'm just looking at my thing on my car here. Yeah, so I'm just gonna listen in while I'm driving and I should be um, I should be home in about 10 minutes or so. Sounds great. And we'll, uh, we'll probably give it a few minutes past six for folks to filter in. So, um, yeah, 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 perfect. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna unmute, I'm gonna mute myself and just listen. Great. Sean, I just want to confirm you're seeing the main yes. without the notes. Correct. Cool. It looks good. Perfect. Are the flowers starting to come in out on the ord? They are. Yeah, we had some uh, footsteps of spring, um, red maids, sun cups. Um, yeah, just the first, the first set are starting to pop. So it's gonna be nice. Some Johnny jump ups. Yeah, I'm sure they're out there. Really? Uh, we're out there with Bruce today. And he showed some good ones. Oh, nice. Yeah, I feel like I'm really gonna miss the uh, the sky looping. Like yeah. that had become this iconic 
memory from all my time in Fort Ord. I mean, I think it was 2019 when it was such a good rain year. One of the places we were out on the NRS, there was just a huge field of sky lupin. And I didn't realize how fragrant they were, but they're mm -hmm. so sweet smelling. The mm -hmm. wind was blowing. I was like, oh man, this is surreal. Yeah, your, your time up here, we've had some nice uh, bumper crops of sky lupin. But the, uh, mm -hmm. the, um, the fields across from your pond and the, on the ranch at the other side of 68, just yeah. last year actually, it's just a blanket of this gorgeous bluish purple. Yeah, I remember that. It's always a, a nice backdrop. And yeah. there's like just enough trees that you can ignore Highway 68. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can you see my pointer pretty easily on the screen? Yeah. It'd be good yeah. if it was bigger, but. Yeah, it's all good. I like to point to things a lot. <laughs> so it's hard yeah. about the virtual is I can't just like go up to the screen and point at things. Is there a way to make the, the cursor a different color? so standard yeah there's Never some presenter feature that makes it into a laser pointer i can't remember cool. how oh huh. that's interesting change pointer to pen wait change pointer to arrow let's try that Well, it's not working. So, <laughs> in theory, there's a way, but yeah, just maybe, move it really maybe now fast. Is not the best time to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, just move it really fast over the image, images we can't see, and we can just see the the movement. Yep. Good. <laughs> Got to ask uh, the other other Robert that's on our call. What do you got? What did you open up, Robert Shields? You're on mute. There we go. Um, Lost Abbey Judgment Day. It's a um, Belgium dark quad ale. Wow, going for the strong stuff. Well, I, I was hoping I had some of my dragon's um, blood. Um, it's a uh, scotch ale style or scotch, uh, scotch um, style porter. They age it in oh, nice. uh, barrels. And how do you, how you doing, Cooper? <laughs> Pretty good. Good to see you again. Long time no drown in a pond with you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, you missed it. Uh, one of the times I was out with Sean, I was actually swimming in my waders in the pond. Oh. <laughs> it was so deep that, you know, we were just that close to getting a complete sample. So, <laughs> but but you weren't in sketchy ponds like you and I have been in, in agricultural areas, right? No, it was less construction <laughs> hazard and more drowning hazard. That yeah, he needed his floaties. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We were out in Gonzales. That was crazy. Um, there was this one, um, it's in the agricultural fields, and this one um, catchment, I looked at it and said, I'm not going in because there's not a natural color of water. It was so, remember that one? It, it was. Yeah, that was, it, it, it looked like a postcard, postcard from like the, the Caribbean, but I somehow doubt from the same, for the yeah. same causes. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to be um, 
actually, um, yeah, we're, I'm going to be out there Monday at another uh, site in Gonzales doing the same thing. Yeah. Hopefully the water doesn't glow in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It's been such a bad year elsewhere. Yeah. You know, well, the, I'm sure the hybrids um, are loving it in their ag ponds. Yeah, there, yeah there's, we're, we were supposed to look at four ponds. We're looking at one. Or no, I can't even say pond, catchment. Mm -hmm. then we'll be doing some are you is dead. are you doing that with uh with jeff again yeah yeah uh jeff we're okay. working through brad uh brad yeah brad or yeah you, you're gonna be running the dna and then um i'm probably the one who's going to be doing the pipette jockeying yeah. yeah 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 so we'll be doing that and then um then we're looking at some property in said um late uh, in april That'll be fun, but I mean, it, then again, it's also going to be really, um, it'll be vernal pools, but it'll be shallow. I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. if, yeah. But there might be really about as far different as you can get. Yeah, in the vernal pool community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There'll be real, real CTS. <laughs> We're at six, but I'm going to give it a couple more minutes in case we have any stragglers filter in. So it looks like we're getting a good amount of folks so far that is exciting and i didn't plan on it but this morning when i grabbed my shirt to wear for at 5 30 this morning blindly grabbing it turns out to be the, the central coast um, well you know <laughs> yeah. i say uh-huh likely mind, story right? great mind. no it was early it was early it was not looking <laughs> <laughs> the, uh dave down there I'm here. I was just laughing because all four of the men here have beards. So statistically probable considering we're all biologists, right? Yeah. Yep. It keeps your face warm in the cold means. Something like that. Sure. Yeah. 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 Or it's a bleak. I don't think anyone has a flavor saver though. Yeah. <laughs> where you, where your beard dips into your soup and you can taste it uh, later. No, I keep mine <laughs> trimmed up. Yeah, I don't always have a beard. Sometimes like I like to, yeah. I like to change it up because I grow it and then I get frustrated with it and I shave it and then I miss it and then you know cycle repeats. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think when I've gets only too seen you. Uh, I gave up on that. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna mute so. All right, getting back on here. Let's see, almost there. Give it one more minute. Nice, good group. <laughs> All right. All right, we're going to get this started. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for uh, joining our uh, first lecture series of 2021. I'm uh, Sean Wagoner. I'm our president-elect, um, and I'm excited everyone's here. A um, little bit about me. My, my uh, background is I'm a wildlife biologist with Burleson Consulting in Monterey. I do a lot of work on Fort Ord um, doing habitat restoration and special status species um, surveys and everything like that. So. I'm really excited to be on uh, the TWS board and I'm excited to have everyone here for our first lecture series of 2021. Before we get into the talk, I'm gonna go through a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items. Um, first is we have a, uh, a bonfire campaign, uh, which is a fundraiser to help rebuild the uh, California condor flock that was impacted by the Dolan fire. Um, we should have a link to the campaign in our chat um, or it should be coming up pretty soon. And uh, let's see, the uh, shirts in the campaign have a awesome uh, uh, artwork of Condor by our president, Jackie. So um, please check that out. Uh, we also have um, uh, open committees um, on the, uh, for the chapter. Uh, we need a professional development chair 
and we are looking to build our conservation affairs committee and our diversity committee. We have currently one member in each committee. So if uh, you're interested, descriptions are in the newsletter and reach out to uh, Jamie, our secretary and our the email should be in the chat. And last thing, our next lecture series is on Thursday, April 22nd. It'll be Kelly Sorensen, the executive director of Intana Wildlife Society. He'll give an update on Big Sur condors in the uh, facility that were impacted by the uh, Dolan fire. So um, with that, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Cooper. He is a PhD student in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at UCLA. Through his research, Robert seeks to answer many urgent conservation questions using modern quantitative techniques. In particular, Robert's research focuses on non-native hybridization between the endangered California tiger salamander and, and the introduced species uh, barred tiger, tiger salamander, um, which threatens the continued survival of our native CTS. So uh, before we hand it off to Robert, hope everyone's enjoying this uh, Friday evening. I'm going to enjoy this uh, <coughs> salamander uh, wine in uh, out of Aptos. Salamandre is what it's called, French. Uh, nice. It's a, a red wine, so I'm uh, thinking there's a, a CRLF in there. Made with real salamander, too. All right, take it away, Robert. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much for... Uh... For that introduction, Sean, and for inviting me to talk, um, it's actually really interesting. I feel like you know vineyards have an opportunity to still facilitate tiger salamander movement, and so it'd be really interesting in the future to to hopefully they you know continue to facilitate that. Right now, I don't think it's ideal, but I think that there's some potential there for you know as long as they're not taking out the ponds, they can still move through those vineyards pretty easily. So, very fitting. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about how pond hydroperiod affects endangered California tiger salamanders, as Sean introduced. And this is work that I'm doing for my PhD at UCLA with my advisor, Brad Schaefer, who's been working on tiger salamanders for many years. Nova, stop. What's that? You're a crybaby. Oh, sorry. Okay, so a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today. So I'll give you an introduction to the system. I will talk a little bit about pond construction and design, how we actually implemented this in the field. I'll talk about our, Cal our CTS data, some experimental results from, from this study, as well as conclusions and potential impacts on conservation and management. So the California tiger salamander it's an endangered salamander. Um, as you can see, this is its range here throughout California. It's mostly located on either side of the Central Valley, although there are distinct population segments down in Santa Barbara County and up in Santa Rosa area. They're endemic to California, so they don't extend outside of the state. And they have this biphasic life cycle. So they start off as an aquatic larvae down here. And eventually they transform into an adult terrestrial salamander. And so for this talk, I'll be focusing on the work that we're doing in Monterey County, which many of you are probably familiar with. So I really wanna um, zoom in on that life history because it's really important to this study. So they start off as embryos, aquatic eggs. It takes them a, a couple weeks to hatch. Once they hatch, they become free swimming uh, aquatic larvae. And in that larval stage, they take about three to five months, um, which is very plastic. And that amount of time is required for them to grow. They do most of their growth in that stage. And then at the end of that time, they emerge as metamorphs and they crawl out of the ponds. From that point, it takes them several years until they're a mature adult. And then those mature adults can live up to about 10 to 12 years in the wild um, or possibly longer. And so what's obvious from that is that these vernal pool systems are really essential to that salamander life history. And these vernal pools are ephemeral wetlands, which means that they fill in the winter and they dry in the summer. And a key component of this talk is the term hydroperiod. And hydroperiod describes the length of time that, that pond holds water, which as you can imagine is pretty variable throughout California based on the pond morphometrics as well as the climate. And this has the potential to be a very strong selective force in CTS. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, here is a brief video showing what happens if ponds dry up too rapidly. So in this pond, there's aquatic larvae and it's drying so quickly, they're unable to complete their life cycle and emerge. And what you have there is a mass mortality event where the pond dries up and no individuals were able to make it out. And so obviously the potential for a lot of selective pressure. So if that wasn't bad enough, uh, tiger salamanders also have to deal with this anthropogenic non-native hybridization. And so what happened is back in the 50s and 60s, these fishing bait dealers grabbed a bunch of non-native salamanders from uh, the panhandle of Texas and brought them in the back of a pickup truck in a kiddie pool and dumped them into some ponds in California to be sold as fishing bait. Uh, apparently water dogs are larval salamanders, go figure. And unfortunately they didn't stay put as we all know, um, they wandered out and they readily hybridized with the native tiger salamanders throughout that region. And so this is a broad picture of where those non-native genes are on the landscape. And so you can see that they're really focused here in the Salinas Valley, although we do see that there are some populations up in up north and down in Santa Barbara as well. So there are non-native hybrids in every single uh, distinct population segment. And so this is a big pressing issue. And if we zoom in on the Salinas Valley, we can see that they are relatively contained. However, we have a lot of evidence to show that they are moving and spreading, especially when you take into account how close these other native ponds are. Another way to look at that, a map that we're probably more familiar with. Um, so each of these blue dots is a known hybrid pond um, from several years ago when I made this. And here I'm just showing a five kilometer buffer around each of those non-native ponds. And you can see that they overlap significantly with a lot of native ponds. And so we have a lot of potential for non-native genes to spread into those native ponds. So you might ask, so what? Who cares, right? What are the effects of hy hybrids out in the environment? Well, <clears throat> Chris Searcy back in 2016 did a really elegant study where he set up these different mesocosms, which are essentially cattle tanks, and he stocked each of those with <clears throat> a known concentration of these sort of normal vernal pool species, the ones that are iconic in California. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what he did was check to see what would happen in each of, those, each of those mesocosms if we have native tiger salamanders, non-native tiger salamanders, or no salamander at all. And this figure here is a principal components chart, which essentially compresses all of those different abundances into two axes. And so this spot here represents the community assemblage when there are only native CTS in those, in those uh, mesocosms. And so the centroid, any departures from that, any movement anywhere else in the figure is a bad thing because it represents a change in the community. And so when we look at what happens in those hybrid tanks, we see that they are non-overlapping, which means that there is a significant change in that community composition, which says that it's not good to have those hybrids in there. They are exerting some pressure and changing the ecosystem. And so you might say, oh, great, just go out there and remove all the hybrids. Well, it's not quite that simple because <clears throat> we also know that if you have no salamander present at all in those vernal pool communities, you have the biggest departure, so the biggest change. And so we can interpret that as the worst scenario. So we can't simply go out there and exterminate the hybrids. What we really wanna do is shift that hybrid circle over the native circle like this, which means what we wanna do is actually select for native phenotypes. So select for those native genes in the hybrids that make them behave more like a native in those communities. And I know you're saying, great, great idea, but how would we actually do that? Well, <clears throat> another really great study by Jarrett Johnson again, using these cattle tanks. So it was an artificial environment, but he found that the, the hybrids really tend to do well in these long duration ponds. And we see that in both mass and survival. And there's some evidence to say that in the short duration ponds, maybe those CTS actually have an advantage. And so that suggests that if we just restore those natural ponds or those unnatural ponds out in the landscape, to shorter hydro periods, maybe we could reverse that pattern of selection and promote natives. But first we need to ask some important questions. Like, does this pattern hold true in nature? I mean, sure it happens in a cattle tank, but do we see that in these realistic ponds? 
And where is the tipping point? So is there an ideal hydro period that starts selecting for native CTS? And also, <clears throat> is there a genomic component? And so can we, do we see a reduction in those non-native genes or alleles? And can that population shift to a more native genotype just based on changing that hydro period? So the objectives of our study were to develop and construct naturalistic ponds, to monitor and measure the effects of hydroperiod and genotype on those larval CTS. And to do this, we evaluated them by using the survival of the larvae. And we can look at survival in both the percent of all the larvae in a given pond that survived, so um, summarizing for each pond. And also, we have an elegant way to, for every single larvae, ask, what is their probability of survival based on their characteristics? And then we also use massive metamorphosis, <clears throat> which is really critical because this sort of defines how fit they will be throughout their life. And we also use genetics. And with genetics, we're asking, are there selection on any specific gene or gene regions that really make an individual do well in the long or short hydro periods? And so just a basic schematic. Uh, this is something we did for spadefoot toads, but we use the same um, scheme out there in Monterey. And what we did is we layered each pond with a PVC liner and protected that liner with geotextile fabric and then filled it over with some topsoil and then allowed them to fill with the rainfall in the winter. And using that technique, seeing some dots here on my screen, sorry about that. So using that technique, we were able to actually construct 18 of these various ponds. To give you a little bit of a, a window into how we did that, this is a time-lapse video showing the construction process. And so what we did is we would dig out a basin, put the liner in there, cut it to size, and then fill it back over with some topsoil. Then what we would do, is stake it all down. So make sure it's all nice and secure in there. And this was a long process. This is time lapse over many days. And then for the experiment, what we did is we encircled each of those ponds with a drift fence. And that drift fence caught all of the metamorphs that attempted to emerge from the ponds and they would go into a pitfall trap. And we checked those pitfall traps every single day as many people on this, on this call know. Uh, and we would check those frequently, and that's how we would find the different metamorphs, and that's how we would know which larvae survived. And here you can actually see those ponds filling up with winter rains the first year. So in order for this experiment to work, we set up those ponds, and then we needed to bring in larvae from the wild in really known and controlled concentrations so that we know what happens in each of those ponds. So we collected larvae from the Fort Ord National Monument here. Um, and we also collected from in, up in Cielo Grande, and we collected several hybrid populations out here in Gonzales. And what does that look like? When we went out to each of these sites, we would drag a large seine through the water, through these ponds, and that seine would catch it, as many larvae as possible. And then we, with a lot of help from a lot of people, uh, would look and pick through those seine nets and find all of the tiger salamander larvae and collect those for um, input into the experiment. So now we're gonna get into a little bit of the results that we were able to determine thus far. So as I mentioned, we collected larvae from known hybrid and native populations, but we didn't know the exact genotypes until we spent the many, many months to run through all of those samples and actually perform the molecular analysis. To do that, we used a target capture protocol which sequenced 5,237 genes, which we used to assess whether or not an individual was native or hybrid. And so from this, we generated a single number, which is the hybrid index score, which I will use from here on out. And that is essentially percent non-native. So a high HIS or hybrid index score means you're almost completely non-native versus a low number, which means you're native. And what we can tell from this figure is that we really didn't have much variation in our non-native hybrids. And we were really hoping to get a good spread all the way across the range. But 
just based on where we sampled and we had tried to hit as many ponds as we could, but they all appear very non-native, which might actually be a very unfortunate but realistic feature out in the wild. Like there may, they may have gone to fixation essentially. So that's unfortunate. We were also really limited by the number of ponds we could access and the number of ponds that we were able to collect larvae from. So in the end, you know, this might hamper our ability to look at shifts in allele frequency since all of them are, are pretty much fixed at the high end. So there's not a lot of variation on which to select. But um, we proceeded anyway. So we created um, several different treatments. So our main treatment was hydroperiod. And so we had ponds with different durations from 80 days to 115 days in five day intervals. And so we had 80, 85, 90, et cetera. And then we added larvae into those ponds in different ratios. And so we really wanted to minimize our impact on native CTS. And we also wanted to see what different concentrations or ratios of native to non-native uh, meant for survival in those ponds. So we had some ponds that were a 50-50 ratio. We had some ponds that were 75% hybrid and other ponds that were 100% hybrid. And it's important to note that 2020 was a really poor breeding year. And so we had just fewer individuals that we could add to the ponds. And so we only added 75 instead of 120. This is the, the issue with doing studies on very, very tricky organisms. And so now for the fun part, uh, this is just some images, some really cool photos, I think, of the hybrid or the metamorphs that emerge from these ponds and just the amount of variation that we found out there. So we had some individuals, probably more native, that were almost completely black, very melanistic. We had some individuals that were almost transparent, a bit see-through. Some individuals that were really spotty um, and you know, really hefty individuals. And then we had some that were almost completely yellow. And we think of this as a very non-native trait. So a lot of variation. And what was critical for the study is that we used all those variation, not necessarily the pigment color, but um, all the variation between those metamorphs to answer these questions about how hydroperiod affects them. So first we'll be looking at metamorph mass. And here it's a little bit complicated. This is essentially the biomass or the average biomass of surviving metamorphs. And what that means is we had to standardize by the number of larvae that went into those ponds. And so what we did was we took the total mass of the, of the metamorphs that came out divided by the number of larvae that actually went into the experiment. So it's, it's something like saying, how many grams of salamander do I get out per one larvae I put in? And this just makes those values comparable across the three different treatment groups. And what we see here is for the hybrids, so this figure here is showing a linear regression of hydroperiod versus the, um, that biomass metric. And it's very significant. So as hydroperiod increases, you get way more grams of hybrids coming out of those ponds. When we look at the native genotypes, it's a little bit more complicated. And so if you can see, there's this one outlier up here, which really screws things up. Um, and I think it's biologically relevant, but it really drives or uh, diminishes the pattern we can see. So if we leave that outlier in, this relationship is non-significant. And so you can think of that as like a flat line. So the, the natives don't really respond to hydroperiod. But if we remove that outlier, then this relationship is significant. However, it's important to note the slope is a lot less than with the hybrids. And so to make sense of this, we plot them together on one figure. And I think this is a lot easier to interpret. And so we see that the hybrid line is above the natives, which means that they just generally produce more mass, but also that slope is much greater. And so we, we can actually calculate that the slope is four times greater for the, the hybrids than it is for the natives. So what that means is for every additional day of hydroperiod, the metamorphs, or sorry, the hybrids will gain four times more mass than the natives do for that added duration, which is really not good for the natives. In addition to that, not only do hybrids benefit from those longer hydroperiods, uh, but hybrids with greater HIS, so the more non-native those hybrids are, the larger they are. 
And so you can see from this regression here on the right that these native individuals with the low hybrid index score are much smaller than these hybrids. And so the more non-native you are, the greater your mass. And we know this is really important because the mass at metamorphosis is a key determinant of their uh, amount of time it takes them to mature. So when they can become uh, reproductively active, the survival, so just their general year to year survival, as well as their full lifetime reproduction for the females. So it's a really critical parameter and unfortunately, it seems that the hybrids sort of win out in every aspect of mass. And this image here just shows you how much that can vary. Even in the same day, these two individuals emerge from the ponds in the same day. One most likely a hybrid, the other most likely a native. So now we'll transition into survival. So survivorship coming out of the ponds. Across the whole experiment, we had about 250 metamorphs survive. Most of those are hybrids, although we had different numbers of hybrids going in, um, but still predominantly hybrid surviving. We had some natives, and we also had a bunch of individuals that failed metamorphosis. And so these were individuals when the pond dried that were left in the center of the basin and were unable to actually become terrestrial. So those would be casualties normally, but we collected them because that might give us some really interesting insight into what genotypes sort of failed that transition. And if we look at the overall survival rate across all the ponds, we had about an 8.5% survival rate, which is greater than, but sort of on par with what we see in the wild. Um, 2019 was a better rain year. And so we had slightly greater survival, uh, but 2020 we had comparable uh, survival as well. And you can see how biased this is that in the long hydro periods, we really see a lot more individuals coming out. Okay, so now in order to compare the, the natives and the hybrids, we look at the proportion of those genotypes that survive. So we're focusing in on each pond, and for each pond we can ask, based on how many um, hybrid larvae went in, how many hybrid metamorphs came out? So what proportion survived? And we do this across the different hydroperiod treatments, as you can see in this figure. And to do this, we used a quasi-binomial generalized linear model, um, which is just because we're going from zero to one and we're using proportions. So we fit sort of a logistic curve to that. And we can see here that hybrids have a strong effect. Now, unfortunately with these types of models, we can't use the slope like we do in the linear models, but we can still compare these two. So again, the native is a bit more complex uh, with the outlier. It's sort of significant, sort of not significant. If we remove the outlier, then uh, it is significant, but again, much less steep. So this pattern sort of uh, repeats itself. So if we plot both of these together, which is easily the best way to interpret this, uh, we see that again, the hybrids are above the natives. And so they generally just have greater survival probability than the natives. And again, we can add this differential line. And so here, the green line shows the difference between the hybrids and the natives. So if you take hybrids and subtract the natives, that green line is what you're left with. And so when we look at that green line, it tells us how much better hybrids do than natives, really the best way to interpret these data. And so the first thing we notice is that it's positive, the lines above zero all the way across, which means hybrids sort of beat the natives all the way throughout the range. But it's also increasing which means that as hydro period increases, those hybrids benefit more and more and more and more as those ponds uh, last longer, which again, not good for the natives. Now, these next set of analyses, um, I have to set up a little bit and explain. So all everything we've been looking at thus far has sort of summarized everything by pond. So we don't get any information about the individuals and how well they survived. Unfortunately, we don't have data on every single larvae that we put into these ponds. And that's because those larvae, they're fragile, they're small, um, you know, handling them too much and trying to measure them is really detrimental and that could seriously impact their survival. So we didn't wanna do that. Instead, what we did is we took a representative sample. So from every one of those wild ponds, we took a bunch of individuals and, um, and sacrificed them. So these are our, our lab standards. Um, 
And then what we do in order to, to do this analysis, we use a bootstrap resampling technique. And so from that representative sample, using the exact numbers that we put into the ponds, we randomly sample them with replacement to sort of capture all of the variation that we expect to see from those source ponds. And then we pair that with the actual true observed data on metamorphs that survived. By combining those two, we create a full data set. And with that full data set, so we have the 2000 larvae that went in, and then we have which of those groups actually survived, which individual survived. And so a huge data set of zeros and ones. And then we can use that to say, based on you know, your, your genotype and your family group, et cetera, how likely are you to actually survive given all these different treatments? And then because this is a bootstrap technique, we can do that tens of thousands of times and ask, whether or not it's significant. And I'll get into that in a bit. So once we have that full data set, then we can put these into a model. And so again, we're using a generalized linear mixed model because we have zeros and ones. And in those models, what we do is we hold everything else constant. So here the equation is larval survival is equal to hydroperiod and the genotype, the hybrid index score. And we can look at each of those individual effects by holding everything else constant and just varying that one parameter. And then we ask, how much does that increase or decrease the chance of survival for that individual? So like I mentioned with Bootstrap, the first check we need to accomplish is, is the model significant? So does, is it actually telling us something important about the system? And so to do that, we have our true data, which is based on all the information that we have. And then we have a randomly sampled uh, data set. What that means is we use that same uh, strategy, except this time, rather than using our true metamorphs that survived, we just randomly assigned survivorship based on the number of individuals that survived that year. And so as expected, when you just randomly uh, assign survivorship, you have something centered around zero. So there's no pattern there. And that's great. Uh, but what we're capturing with this test is how much variation there is just in the data, just by chance alone. And so the fact that our true data lies so much further outside of that distribution, that's like our, our test, that's our p-value. And so because there's no overlap, that means that this is very significant. And so now that that's out of the way, we can actually look at that relationship. And so here we see very similar to the, the, others, the, the other analyses, that as hydroperiod increases, an individual's probability of surviving increases greatly. So the short ponds, very few individuals survive, but in the long duration ponds, you have a lot greater chance of survival. We can do the same test for the hybrid index score, so for the genotype. And here we see a little bit of overlap. And so there's just a tiny bit of, of instances of those model iterations where we do get a significant pattern just by chance. But that overlap is only like 0.5%. So if we're talking p-values, this would be a p-value of 0 0.005. So it's still very significant, uh, but it's important to do that test. And here, what's sort of more interesting for our study is that as you become more non-native, so individuals that are more non-native are more likely to survive. So if you go into the pond and you're a native, you're already at a disadvantage compared to a hybrid that goes in the pond, especially one that's very non-native. Again, not a good story for the natives. So now what's even more fascinating about this is we can look at the interaction term. So what I mean by this is how hydroperiod and genotype combine together in order to affect larval survival. And so again, like with the other analyses, we see that the hybrid line is on top of the native line, which means that across the range of hydroperiods, the hybrids do better no matter what. And we can also plot the difference. So again, that green line is the subtraction, the difference between the hybrids and the natives. So you take the red line, you subtract the blue line, and then you get the green line. And that tells us how much better the hybrids did than the natives across the different treatments. And again, we see that it's positive. So the hybrids beat the natives across all the different hydroperiod treatments. And another way to assess that is if we look at the area between those two lines. So when we start off here 
at the short hydro period, 80 days, there's really not much difference between hybrids and natives. But as we increase the hydro period, that difference grows and grows and grows. And this means that those non-native hybrids are benefiting more from those long hydro periods than the natives are. And that grows pretty rapidly. Looking at just the difference between the two. So again, we're looking at just the difference. This is how much more the hybrids benefit from the natives. And if we look at the short hydro period, around an 80 day hydro period, there's really not much of a benefit a little less than 1%. So that's 0.01 probability, so around 1%. But if we look at how much those hybrids benefit in the long duration, at a, say 115 day hydro period, we look and it's about an 8% increase in survival. So if we do the math, we see that the hybrids benefit 10 times more than the natives when we increase that hydro period. And that is incredibly significant for tiger salamander larvae, which experience really high mortality. So this is a huge difference. And again, very unfortunate for the native genotypes. So this is most of what we've collected thus far. Um, our conclusions are sadly a little bleak, but there is still some potential for hope. So it appears that hybrids have greater fitness than the natives in everything we've looked at. And so in the probability of survival, so for any given larvae, hybrids are more likely to survive. And they're also more likely to be massive at the end of that, once they come out, once they um, transform and come out as metamorphs. And that this advantage increases with longer hydro period and with increasing non-native genotype, the hybrid index score. And unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be an ideal hydro period that actually benefits the natives as we hoped or thought there might be. However, reducing that hydro period could seriously remove the advantage of those non-native hybrids. Just to show you what that looks like, this is the figure that I showed in the introduction, which <clears throat> was from the 2013 Jarrett Johnson study. And here, you know, we saw in the short hydro period that maybe there was a benefit of survival for the natives. Using the information from this present study, we see that, well, that's not really the case. The pattern mostly holds true, but we see that natives always benefit from longer hydro periods, but way less than the, the non-natives do. However, if we go out and modify those unnatural ponds, so these ponds that are like cattle ponds that hold water all year round, if we go out there and actually cut the berm or reduce the hydro period of those ponds, we could, in, instead of promoting this much fitness in the hybrids, we could reduce it down to a tiny amount. And maybe we can't select for the natives, but we could at least give the hybrids an equal ground or equal chance of survival and proliferation. So some future directions, <clears throat> I'm not done at all. I'm literally doing these analyses like this week uh, before this talk. So it's a really exciting time. Um, I want to look at specific loci. And so in a more comprehensive genomic techniques, uh, ask whether or not certain loci contribute to that success of the hybrids. Like maybe there's just a few genes that drive this pattern that we can actually select for. And then maybe once the natives have those genes, they don't need to be fully non-native. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a hope. Um, but we think that this will be a much more comprehensive way of analyzing it rather than compressing the whole genotype down to a single percentage. We're also hoping to publish this pond construction model, this uh, construction model, also the mathematical model that predicts hydro period to help inform the creation of new ponds or the, the modification of existing ponds to select for the various amphibians that live in them. And with that, tons of acknowledgements. This really wouldn't have been possible without many people uh, on this call, uh, as well as a lot of our great colleagues and uh, managers, agency folks, and everyone who really contributed to this. And I can't be more grateful for uh, all of the help that they've given. And with that, I would love to take some questions. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would say uh, use the chat function or uh, use the raise your hand function, which is 
the uh, there's a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. If you press that, there's a raise your hand button. So we can, so no one goes all at once. It looks like Bart has his hand raised. Go ahead, Bart. Hey, thanks um, for taking my question. Hi, Robert. Just curious about what your thoughts are regarding to potential effects of climate change. Um, some of the predictions are, for our area at least, showing that we may get more regular rain events throughout um, in the future. So periods with longer droughts and followed by periods where you have just huge amounts of precipitation and what your expected re, uh, effects of that would be on the natives versus the hybrids. Are, are the hybrids better adapted? At that? I would think that the natives would be better adapted to that variation, but I'm just kind of curious what your prognosis on that may be. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you know, probably not an easy one to answer, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, so, you know, the reason we think that natives would be better in an environment where the hydro period is shorter is because they've evolved in the California landscape where, you know, there usually isn't much water. What little water is there is going to evaporate really quickly. And so I think that's why we think that the, the natives do just as well in the short hydro period and don't really experience that much advantage. So in a really stochastic regime where rainfall is unpredictable, then I think that the natives would be better suited in those drought years, but then you're also going to have those years of really heavy rainfall where the hybrids might just really, really, you know, reproduce. You might see pedomorphs. Um, so I think the natives would be better in those drought years, but at the same time, you might have those hybrids doing better in the really heavy rain, rain years. And so at that point, it becomes really about the maximum depth of the ponds and how much hydro period they can support. Because if you have a pond with a low berm, it doesn't matter how much it rains, it's only gonna fill to a certain amount. Um, and so in those ponds, we can continue to keep that short hydro period even in those heavy rainfall years. And so in that case, you might benefit the natives in no matter what the climate is, no matter what the rainfall is. Awesome. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Fred has his hands up. Go ahead, Fred. Awesome talk, Robert. This is super cool in so many ways. Um, one thing I was just I was wondering if you could, um, I, I guess I've got a two part question. From a lot of those graphs, it looked like no matter how short you made the hydro period, um, you know, the, the hybrids did even just a little bit better in, in every case. And, and so extrapolating from that, does that mean that no matter how short the, the hydro period, if, if those ponds reflected re reality, that we would just see a progressive erosion of the native gene pool until, they, um, you know, until it was extinguished? Is that kind of the, the corollary of, of those results so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the field is even more complex than we were able to recreate. So, you know, there is some, a little bit of skepticism, but I think that experimentally, this is the best we can do to test that hypothesis. And sadly, it does seem like that is a real possibility. Um, you know, are there other factors? Like maybe if we do this and also remove pedomorphs or, you know, add some degree of wildlife management, maybe we can shift it enough. Because I think that what we're experiencing right now especially in the Salinas Valley, you know, where you have all these really unnaturally deep ponds, is we're seeing that huge amount of advantage. And so if we reduce that down, maybe that's enough for the just sheer numbers of the natives to, uh, you know, to maintain. But if we take the raw values, you're, you're totally right in that if we take the raw values from my study and just project that a thousand years, it would say that they would pretty much go to fixation in all the ponds. Yeah, but I don't know if that's really the actual case. That's, you know, what we've determined. Right, yeah. So I guess that leads to the second part of my question, which is if there was some kind of wholesale difference between all of your ponds and let's say all the, the natural ponds on Fort Ord that um, was favorable to the natives, then I I'm, I'm just want to be the optimist here. If maybe that whole hybrid curve would be down a little. There'd obviously still be the hydro period effect that gave 
the hybrid's an advantage with a long hydro period. But if for some reason your ponds were just a little unfavorable to the natives compared to the um, to the native ponds on Fort Ord, you, we could maybe have a little bit of optimism that that the natives would actually eventually win out if we just reduce the hydro period. Yeah, one important thing is that in this study, you know, we really didn't want to impact the native CTS population too much. I mean, they're already struggling. And so we didn't have any treatments that were just natives alone. And so, you know, we, we know that we didn't capture the full story with the natives because this was mostly about what selection pressures we can exert on those non-natives. And so there is a potential, you know, that if the hybrids are in very low frequencies, you know, so imagine you have a native pond and you have one hybrid that wanders in and breeds, maybe in that scenario, you know, we would see a slight difference. We would see that the natives do outcompete those hybrids in that scenario. One interesting thing, I didn't get a chance to show it in this talk, but you know, what we see is like we can define what the different family groups are that went in using the genetics. And what we see, a significant trend is that those family groups they really uh, reduce in diversity, meaning that there tends to be one or two family groups that really take off. And, you know, as a partly a behavioral biologist, I really hesitate to start saying like, oh man, there's some sort of kin selection or, you know, like some group um, dynamics there. But that is sort of what we're seeing that maybe if the natives are in abundance to begin with, that there's some sort of benefit to them, you know, that maybe they, they don't help each other out, but maybe they eat each other less or something like that. So there is a chance that having a mostly native population might actually benefit them more. So I like to be hopeful. So I'm totally into that. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Fred. I'm going to go to the chat for some questions. Uh, what is, can you define a pedomorph, Robert? Yes, I would be happy to. So Pedomorphs play a big role in this, well, potentially a big role in this story, and it's really fascinating what goes on with them. Uh, so pedomorphs are larval tiger salamanders that never get the message to get out of the pond. And so they become sexually mature in their aquatic like form. So they look like gigantic larvae, but they're sexually active and they can you know, mate with other females. They can do anything uh, that, a, that a normal terrestrial adult would. And so they're essentially individuals that get into a really deep pond that they think is going to last a long time, and they stay in that aquatic stage. And so the definition of a pedomorph is an individual, some species that maintains their juvenile characteristics while becoming uh, reproductive. So you see them on Fort Ord. Um, it's something that we've never seen in a pure native tiger salamander. It's something that appears to have been brought in with the non-natives, um, probably because it's not a winning strategy if you're a native CTS. California is too unpredictable. The water doesn't last long enough. And so we think that that was lost in the CTS because their closest living relative is the axolotl. Um, so CTS is sister to the axolotl and these non-native salamanders. And so both of those have the ability to become pedomorphic. The axolotl is entirely pedomorphic. And then the, the native CTS have lost that trait. Awesome. Yeah, I could Thank go you. on for an entire talk about, <laughs> about the pedomorphs because they're really <laughs> fascinating. Well, well, we'll schedule you for the fall for our another virtual series. Talk. Um, okay, I got one more question. Let's see. Uh, where did you say the barred tiger salamander is from? So the barred tiger salamander as a species extends throughout the Great Basin. So Texas all the way up almost into Canada, I think. And so a huge range. But using genetics, um, Jarrett Johnson, long before I was here, actually identified which population the introduction was from. And so we've narrowed it down to the panhandle of Texas, so the very northern section of Texas. Awesome, great. Let's see, uh, Rachel Perp has her hand raised. Go ahead, Rachel. Hey, hey, Robert, hey, everybody. Um, I think one of the graphs early in your presentation kind of showed this data, but I didn't have enough, enough time to really grasp it. So is the, is the assumption that the more native genotype outnumbers the hybrids like throughout the range overall? And do we know kind of how much since it sounds like that could be important in the long term since we're on kind of such a hair trigger as far as the disadvantages of the um, shorter hydro period for the hybrid? Yeah, that's a great question. And I do apologize for moving through all those figures quickly. There's a lot to cover, so my bad. Um, 
but yeah, I know the figure you're talking about where we show that they're all pretty much non-native. And we were surprised by that. What we found when we look at a single pond throughout 10 or 20 years, we see that some years it's very non-native, but other years we see a lot of natives and individuals that are almost completely native, even in the heart of those hybrid zones. So there is a lot of variation, we think, still out there in the wild. Um, so hopefully, even in areas that are like right in the middle of the hybrid zone, we still think that there are some native or mostly native individuals lingering, you know, it's a long lived species. Um, I think more to that point, you know, the, the non-natives are fairly isolated right now in the Salinas Valley. And so all of the other populations, you know, as we go further out are all native. And so they're, they still, you know, more than outnumber the non-natives, but it does seem like as soon as you start getting some non-native genes in a pond, it really does seem like they sort of just take off. So that is sort of the unfortunate uh, reality of those uh, like deep in the hybrid zone. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let's see, uh, Bart has his hand raised again. Go ahead, Bart. Hey, Robert, do you have any thoughts about how landscape features play a role into the selection for native versus non-native um, genes? I'm thinking about your map from the beginning of the presentation, how it showed a lot of hybrids expanding from those uh, ponds in Salinas Valley, where it's mostly flat. And then I'm thinking of Fort Orr, which has much more varied topography. And my understanding is that the most recent data analysis of the genetics of the Fort Orr CTS show that they're much more uh, native than they was originally thought when um, Brad Schaefer originally did his genetics. So could it be that there are some landscape features that would prohibit the bar salamander genes from spreading into? That is a great question. And we, um, and I think you're a part of this conversation, you know, we're really hoping to do some heavy hitting genomics on Fort Ord specifically to exactly ask that question. We do think that there are some barriers, you know, you look at a, you look at a region and you see that the, you know, the non-native genes have not spread out of this one pond for 30 years. And you got to ask yourself, you know, why is that? It's, it's not entirely obvious, um, you know, at first glance, but I really think that there are some features that we can look at. Uh, you know, they do surprisingly well, you know, covering large distances, covering really rolling hills, like the whole CTS species does. But yeah, the question, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I think it also has to do with the, the ponds that are, you know, that, that are presented as a stepping stone. Like maybe when you have a bunch of deep ponds, like in the Salinas Valley, you have a lot greater uh, facilitation of dispersal because they get to a deep pond and then they just, you know, really reproduce and they get to another deep pond and they really reproduce. So maybe if you have a deep pond that's surrounded by really shallow ponds where the natives have, or the non-natives have less an advantage, maybe the natives have an advantage, that could be a really critical landscape feature in stopping the spread. We also know that some non-native structures like Ironically, in uh, I think it's Laguna Seca, you know, it's right there uh, where the hybrids could be, but it's always been native and, you know, it might be because of that, you know, that road or whatever, <laughs> or the, you know, the track. Uh, but yeah, no, we see a lot of these anecdotes of like what could be stopping the spread, but we don't have any concrete data yet as to what actually is. One important thing is, you know, an earlier study that, you know, I, I did for my first chapter of my PhD was on the temperature performance. And so how well hybrids and natives do with respect to like heat and extreme heat. And from my study, as well as a previous study that Jared did, shows that hybrids can really tolerate and perform better in those high temperatures. So when you have landscape features that are really hot, they mostly move at night. So that's a little bit less of a, you know, an issue, but the warmer it is in a landscape, the greater we think it's facilitating the, the hybrid movement. So tons of interesting stuff to look at there, but I don't think we know yet. I have a quick question, Robert. Um, uh, seems like the uh, non-natives have really hit our central coast hard. What about the Sonoma and or the Santa Barbara DPS populations of CTS? Yeah, so I know less about the Sonoma uh, populations, but up there, there's 
very few ponds. So I think that they have a pretty good grasp on where it is. And I think that they're, I mean, that's a pretty good example of where hard hitting mitigation can probably, you know, maybe not completely remove the, the non-native threat, but there's fewer ponds. I think there's less connectivity. So in that circumstance, like the pond they're in, they're in and, you know, they're dug in deep. Uh, but I think that there's a little bit more potential for control. But I, I admit, you know, I'm not uh, an expert on, on that population. Down in Santa Barbara, it's also pretty good. It's, it's pretty weird. Um, the non-natives are actually, I think they might be in two ponds. I think Aaron might be on this. You could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but one of the main populations is actually in a penitentiary, which has great hmm. metaphoric value. But uh, yeah, actually like in a prison, there's a pond and it's entirely non-native. And so I think that if they got out, that would be a huge problem. But for now, at least they're, they're um, stuck in one or two ponds. And I don't know if you also noticed, but like Fort Hunter Liggett also has a population of almost entirely non-natives. Mm -hmm. And we think that that might be outside the range of native CTS. And so that might've been a secondary introduction where the only ones in there are non-native and they just stayed non-native. So that's another odd oddity when you're looking at a map, you get this one little spot of like super non-native. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Aaron in the chat said they're, they're in four ponds in Santa Barbara County. Oh, four ponds, well. Cool, uh, real quick, let's go to the chat real quick. Uh, is there any known sale of non-natives ongoing in California? If not, when did it end? Oh, that's a great question. Um, oof, I don't, I'm pretty sure there are not because I don't think you're even allowed to transport non-natives or any salamanders across state lines. And I believe that was the Lacey Act in 19... <laughs> Someone might be able, Rob, do you, do you have a good answer yeah, for this? Yeah, um, yeah Robert's hands up. <laughs> se separate question, but the answer yeah. to that is um, um, no, none of the genus are available for sale in California. Other salamander genuses and newts are available. Um, they changed it up, Cruallo's zero, zero uh, salamanders, but they've restricted it strictly down to the genus. Uh, like oxalotl and any bard and CTS cannot go out, of course, since they're federal and state. Um, but I think that um, the changes to it was within the last few years to allow the other genuses to be sold. Oh, that's right. I do remember. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's a good one, too. The axolotl, which, again, is sort of nested within this bard tiger salamander, native tiger salamander um, complex. That is a very common pet. It probably wouldn't do very well in a lot of the, the California ponds, but you know, some it of those artificial would, ones. It probably would do quite well because it takes extremely cold temperatures and high temperatures also. It but it a, has to be a permanent, a permanent yeah, pond. It has to if be it dries permanent. up once, that permanent. whole lineage is they're gone. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, Salinas Valley. Yeah. My my question is, you know, I do a lot of work on the um, upper part of Fort Ord, the highlands of um Fort Ord, uh um at the uh, reservation and uh, East Garrison Road and so forth up that development. And we've never been able to do the genetics on uh, the um, CTS there, but we've seen them come out of the water and they're very typical of what uh, Robert and I were seeing in uh, Gonzales, you know, very large with the uh, yellow and so forth. And I was hoping that they wouldn't be because we're up in the highlands above the Salinas Valley. I'm wondering, you know, thinking they wouldn't come up the bluffs like that. But the army had, the officers had fishing ponds near our site that were only recently in the last 20 years dewatered and bass were removed. So I suspect that the officers were using water dogs as bait up on the upper part. And that's the introduction to our area and possibly the same with Hunter Liggett. As a, there's, there probably were officers hunting or uh, fishing ponds um, that uh, that they dug deeper and brought in water dogs for, for bait. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good guess as to what happened. I mean, it's, it's, it's the perfect storm, right? You have these really deep ponds and then you're adding these non-native larvae. However, I mean, the one thing is that usually whenever you have a pond with any centrarchid, you know, or any sort of fish in there, they usually decimate the amphibian population and you almost never find 
you know, salamanders that can survive in those ponds. However, if they then remove those fish and those salamanders are around, then that is the perfect storm for introduction. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. It will be interesting, you know, if, you, if we think that there's secondary introductions, we can attempt to get at that story with the genetics. And so it'd be great to have some, some tissues and, you know, ask that question. I don't know Hunter Liggett, but you know, I can possibly get the other. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you, Robert Shields. All right, probably have one more question um, in the chat. If there are ponds where you know there are all non-native and hybrids, is it possible to remove slash cull those individuals to prohibit further spread of them? It's a, a good last question. That is a good last question. And, you know, that's sort of where the needle is resting right now as far as what can we do. Um, and the truth is it's a very labor intensive and time intensive process because these salamanders, they, you know, they're in the pond, um, especially if they're non patamorphic so that, you know, just a normal salamander, it's in the pond only as a larvae, and then it wanders off into the upland habitat. And they can go, you know, about a kilometer each breeding season up into the upland habitat. And they only come back out to breed about twice in their life, and their life can be about 10 to 12 years. And so you imagine if you did a intensive removal study or you know, uh, management action, you would need to repeat that for 10 or 12 years, maybe 15 years to be sure that you've gotten everything out. Um, and even then, you know, there's the chance that salamanders didn't return to their natal pond, but they you know, went, kept going and, and actually migrated to a new pond. And so even then you're not guaranteed to get all of the individuals that were initially introduced. So it, it can be done. Has it been done is a great question. I don't think it has. I know that, you know, like Bruce has done some great work there at Toro Pond and the Fort Ord where they did the salamander roundup. And I think that is a great example because it's a deep pond. It's fairly disconnected from the other ponds. And so there's less of a chance for those salamanders to have, have made it out into the other CTS ponds. And this is where that the pedomorphic story is, is really um, pertinent because in those ponds, my guess is that they had a lot of pedomorphs. They know that because they've removed a lot. Uh, but my guess is those individuals were just cranking out offspring because they didn't have to go through that dangerous process of wandering up into the hills and then wandering back whenever they're ready to breed. They're just in that pond. And so I think the chances of them just cranking out individuals, cranking out offspring is really high. And so I think that you know what, what Bruce and other managers were doing there at Toro Pond made sense because you remove those, you remove one of the greatest um, sort of complications, one of the greatest factories of those non-native genes. And I think that can have a big impact. But as far as like going to a hybrid pond and like trying to, you know, just nuke the area and stop everyone from, stop all the non-native genes there, it's very difficult. You can also, yeah. Uh, another idea that's been proposed is you drain the pond, you, you stick in a drain, but you got to keep it drained for 15 years, you know, 12 to 15 years. So that is less labor in in intensive, but you're going to be seriously impacting the other wildlife in the area that require those ponds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I said last question, but we got a couple more good ones in the chat. So if you're up for it, Robert, a couple more. I am up for it. All yeah. right. So let's see. How much predation did you have of non-natives? on the natives in your ponds? Fantastic question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I, 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 tell. I imagine it was significant. And I think that that is a huge um, component of that proportion surviving. Mm. Um, there was no significant difference between the different uh, larval treatments. So having more non-natives or uh, you know, that ratio of non-native to native. But I think that's a sample size issue. You know, there's only so many ways I can parse up that data. I think that that is probably a, a great explanation for why it's not data that I showed here, but I was just mentioning how we saw that uh, certain family groups became overrepresented in the end. And so if, you know, we had a balanced design going in and then in the end, maybe like 70% of all the surviving metamorphs are from a single family from a single source population. And that might be a great um, piece of evidence to support the fact that there's some sort of kin selection that maybe those, you know, the non-natives ate everybody else, but not their brothers and sisters. 
there's some evidence for it in the literature. Uh, it's something I really want to investigate. I don't have the best data to support that, but I think that could be a huge factor driving that um, those differences in survival. But I would, uh, yeah, I would love to do another study where I could get that. <laughs> yeah, that's a a real quick quick kind of related question. You know, if you have a pond in the Snakes Valley that's super you know mucky and very uh, you know low quality, and there's very other little uh, uh, critters in there for the salamanders to eat. Very, the the macro invertebrate population is very poor. Are these hybrids basically just eating themselves? It's like where are they finding their 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 food to to grow? Um, if you're in a system that's has very little macro inverts, if none, and it's just the hybrids. Yeah, I think you know. It's a good question. I think it's the you know they they're very diverse in their diet, right? They start mm -hmm. off eating planktonic, you know, invertebrates, um, and then they progress up through the entire food chain until they're the the top aquatic predators. So, you know, usually there's something to eat in a pond. If you really have a situation where there's like you know they've either eaten all the food or um, whatever else, I think that the non-natives will certainly turn on each other. Yeah. You know, I say kin selection, like it's some fancy thing going on, but really, usually what it is, is just that you can't eat your brothers and sisters because they're as big as you. <laughs> it's usually the, the way that works out. And so if there is, and there is evidence to show that like the sizes aren't perfect like that. It's not like all your brothers and sisters are your same size. Some individuals do take off. And in those circumstances where there are differences in size, I'm sure that they snack on each other all the time. Yeah, cool. But again, that's not something we think happens in the native CTS. That's just the, mm -hmm. the non-natives. but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's probably a, a very common thing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right. Another question from the chat. Another good one. Do the non-natives and hybrids travel up to the uh, 1.24 miles like the natives? Um, yes. As far as we know, let's see. We're pretty sure, I think is the correct answer, because the way that we really get those numbers is really intensive long-term data sets from that that Brad and Chris Searcy did up in Jepson Prairie, so Merced, and then uh, they did also in Hastings in, in Monterey. And that's when they can really start assessing what the migration rates are. They also did that in Santa Barbara just recently where they were pit tagging individuals, but it requires a pretty extensive data set to actually get those values. And so we are assuming that they move as much, um, you know, partly because they're half native, you know, these hybrids do have native genes in them. But as far as how far the hybrids are moving, we haven't directly tested that. So we, it is a bit of an assumption. Yeah, uh, the one study that they did do, I mentioned earlier, uh, Jared Johnson did this where he put them on treadmills and showed that they have the same or better movement capabilities, which is great to see. Uh, but no, sorry, the result is not great to see, but seeing the little salamanders moving around on treadmills is, is pretty fascinating. Um, so at least from that evidence, they have as good or better endurance in, in locomotion. Got it, awesome. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, uh, throw in the chat or raise your hand. Um, if not, we will probably wrap this up and uh, Robert Cooper, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, awesome. And um, we're really happy you're able to show us um, new and more insight on this really important topic. So yeah, thanks everybody thank for joining. My pleasure. Yeah, this is great. Right. Well, um, Robert, do you want, I mean, we could be a little abstract about what you and I worked on in Gonzales on the percentages, like, because I mean, we did two years collecting different parts of the season. So we get different uh, breeding events. And of the like 90 animals that were sampled, nine, uh, all of them were 95% or higher hybrid gene. And no individual had more than, had didn't even know if the individual had more than 10% native gene in it and those pools i don't remember much of any food source there was i don't remember finding a lot of insect material in those in those ponds yeah what are they eating there's no macro inverts there were some bite there was there were bite marks on quite a few of them and the and some of them had massive mouths the larger ones the larger larvae we're getting were 
they definitely had the extreme mouth on them. Yeah, you know, I'm sure that they're they're eating con specifics. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a really cool study that's in the pipeline right now that's hopefully coming out that Chris Searcy did uh, with some collaborators where they actually flushed the stomachs of the larvae to see oh, wow. what they were eating exactly. And I think it's pretty diverse. I think that they have, you know, they, they eat whatever, like honestly, anything that fits in yeah. their mouth. I think that they'll even eat, you know, copepods still as large individuals. It's just not ideal and it probably won't sustain them. But, you know, I think that they do have a clear preference that they will always go for, but will eat anything that's in there. And so yeah. I really wonder, yeah, in those really murky ponds, you know, maybe we're not getting everything in the dip nets and sains that we use, like the, the small stuff, but I can't we, make I mean, a good diet. Use, using the same dip nets, literally the same dip nets, like in up at the vernal pools in Merced, we're getting a good um, array of arthropods. And, um, mm -hmm. and also up in um, Madera County and so forth, uh, Jeff and I are up there. And But I don't remember, I remember some snails and maybe some back swimmers, a few a low number of back swimmers that we were getting in those ag ponds. And I'll be out there Monday. <laughs> Just try to see what else. You know, <laughs> looking at different things. So, but yeah, I mean, that, yeah. I was surprised about that. Um, but in the future, we try to get the, I, someone mentioned that they've been on Hunter Liggett for 26 years or something. Um, you know, did, before I forget, Jackie, our president, has been working there for 20 yeah, years. That's so never, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> and were, were there old um, bass fishing ponds on Liggett? Yeah, there's a, a number of cattle ponds out there. We also have pretty extensive vernal pool systems as well. Mm -hmm. um, probably a lot of them are non-natural, just from military activity and, uh, you know, trucks getting stuck and from borrow pits to ordinance blowing them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a yeah. few of those. <laughs> yeah, right. So we yeah. have a lot of, um, it's, it, I think it's really fascinating because we have the salamanders in in some of the larger ponds, but we also have them in the tiny little vernal pools as well. So it's yeah, we, yeah. and it's it's a conundrum as far as managing it because the what Fish and Wildlife Service at one point said you have to get rid of all of them. And we're like, okay, it's one hundred and sixty five thousand acres, and yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of habitat and a lot of squirrel holes, and they live a long time. So yeah, yeah. It, well, I mean, you know, between the, the two bases, I think we can, you know, Sean has access to a large portion of the portion of the base. I have a relationship with the um, the Highlands area, uh, closer to the Gonzales, the hot spot, Thank you. Uh, the center of uh, hybrid hybridization or introduction. Um, but maybe we can get, you know, like you're saying, you know, do a, a, a genetic history on them. That would be fantastic. Yeah, we do have, so I know we have run a lot of the ones from Fort Hunter Leggett and I can't remember if we know the origin from where they're from, uh, but mm -hmm. it, it, you know, they're completely non-native. So it seems like it was either from, I think that they're very closely related. So the ones that were brought in into the Salinas Valley are from Five Star Fish Farms. Um, it's a specific bait, you know, dealer that mm -hmm. we tracked and they still have individuals um, up somewhere. And so we use those as like our known reference population that were introduced. And so I think that the ones in Fort Hunter Leggett are actually very closely related to those. So it's unclear whether or not they were brought in from the same source or they were brought into the Salinas Valley and then transported. Uh, but either way, I think that they are very closely related. Well, you got, you've got officers going back and forth between two army bases. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Quick question. I remember bumping into a discussion about trying to cull non-native populations and the answer from the service was, hell no, if there's any potential native genes. Is that something you guys have bumped into recently? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the long game, right? Where we're really struggling with that exact decision. And I think that that gets to um, Chris's study, you know, that showed the community assemblage with the mm -hmm. native, the non-native and the no salamander. And, you know, I think there you're choosing, do we want the little difference with the non-natives or do we want the big difference with the no salamanders? Um, and I think that's why it's so difficult. And that's why we're really hoping that my study would would <laughs> demonstrate like, oh, you, you shorten the hydro period and the natives do so much better. Sadly, maybe predictably that wasn't the case. Um, but so now, 
you know, we got to ask the question. I think for the another analysis I want to do is actually use some of the demographic models that, that Chris has developed and asked, okay, so if we do go to that really short hydro period and we do reduce that benefit, let's run some demographic simulations to say in a given population, is this effective? It, you know, it, is this just sort of rain in the bucket, like not much at all? Um, I don't know. My, my, I suspect, you know, well, actually, I don't know. At those really short hydro periods, it might be really interesting to see what those demographic dynamics work out to be. But um, it's a great question. You know, will it work in the end? I don't really know. Um, the feds are being more flexible. I think they're waiting for the state to decide um, for like Gonzales area, um, which is, you know, they're mutants. <laughs> they're walking around. They drive cars. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But um, I, the feds have basically written that off, but they don't, they want the state to make the final decision. And that's, I think, what um, Brad might be working on, when it, or you and Brad and others are working on down at UCLA. Is a, is yep, this, this was a critical report component to. of that decision. So, yeah, you know, these data are still pretty fresh to me. So, I, you know, yeah, this figuring um, out exactly what the recommendation yeah, this was a question that had been brought up like 10 years ago when the non-natives were found in Santa Barbara. And mm -hmm. the simple answer was just, you know, even if it looked like a full, full-blown non-native, you can't touch it. Same thing. So yeah, the history of policy for hybrids is really murky and barely there. Yeah. You know, I think it was 96, you know, they they wrote um I forget what it's called. They didn't use the term hybridization, but it's like crossed act or something where, you know, they, they started to generate this idea that like, well, if you could visually tell if it's a native or non-native, then you can exterminate it, but it never actually got ratified or written into law. And so it just sort of fizzled out. And there are some people that can really claim that they can tell a native and non-native tiger salamander. Uh, but, you know, we've done the genetics and it, it's, sometimes we're surprised. Sometimes we're holding an individual and you're like, no, there's no way that's native or non-native. And yeah, I think that there, there I think 90% of the time you can tell pretty easily, but it's that 10% that's a really vital distinction, you know, between whether or not you're killing an individual or trying to help it and <laughs> make sure that it, it has many babies. It's a tough, uh, tough decision. Visu visually, I have the full range coming out of a pond in Fort Ord ranging from they're almost all yellow with a bit of black to being all black with background uh, yellow, just like the one, pure ones up at, uh, by, back, I'm working with in UC Merced area. On East Garrison, Robert? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's, and that's, a, that's a new catchment pond. That is not a historical low spot. That was built as a percolation for a housing development and the CTX and, and hybrids have populated it within six years of the construction of the of the of the um perk pond and the only reason they took hold was the percolation the design of the pond was not properly done and it didn't percolate robert can i ask a follow-up question uh is that the pond you're talking about Imgen road right on the corner there next to east garrison you're a mute robert yes it is that deep catchment pond i was wondering about that and then yeah did you find any CTS this year? Um, no, because they fixed it. Oh, okay. Um, so um, uh, the water was not holding. Um, so I did, we didn't monitor it because it's not part of the project in terms of uh, uh, saning it and so forth. It's more of um, if they were going to drain it, we would monitor it and uh, transport any animals out to our um, release site. And um, so what they've added a deep... Uh, uh, cut in the middle to allow percolation because no water is technically no water is allowed to uh, exit that um, housing development mm -hmm. has to percolate in yeah I remember a few years ago that that pond or whatever you want a catchment basin was just like full to the brim it went over <laughs> it went over it um it, it went over the overflow into a known CTS area which is on the is uh, west of engine on uh, that low spot there that has a known um uh vernal pool type area or more more just a lowland uh basin area um where in the past the population has been there but we release at the old fishing pond for the officers 
which uh, was drained many years, like within the last 20 years. So yeah, it's a interesting area, but I, I'm surprised that how, you know, how hybridized they look because those animals would have had to come up that bluff. And um, that's pretty, that's a pretty steep area since there's an area there called the bluff yeah. too. I mean, it's a cliff. So. It would be really great to get some samples from there because that, you know, that would represent the furthest I think if, edge, you know, moving. Yeah, I think if we develop it in a sense of no cost to them, <laughs> and um, it's interesting that way to do. Um, so it's, um, you know. Yeah, next time I'm up in the area, you know, I could just come out and snip a few tails and that would be the end of it. So that's pretty yeah. Um There's a lock gate now. Well, I met with permission, you know, assuming that you're <laughs> monitoring that area. Yeah. <clears throat> damn it, I left it. Damn it, I left the gate open again. <laughs> Everybody, thank you. Good night. Thanks, David. Thank you for joining, David. <clears throat> okay. Good stuff. Well, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that yeah, was great. Thank you. I'm glad everyone got to join and it was fun. So, hey, Thor, looks like my bus, boss just got on. It's my boss door right there. You're on mute, bud. Just popping in to say hi. How's it going, Thor? Good to see good, you. Good. I cut first half of your talk, Robert. It was on a roll, but then family dinner happened. So I <laughs> had to bounce out. So Sean, you've recorded this, right? We're recording it, yes. Awesome. So I look forward to checking it out later. Sounds good. Yeah. Let me know if you have any questions. Like I said, I'm still, I'm still digesting all this. I have the figures, but I don't have the, you know, the full story in my head yet of how bad this is, what it means. Uh, that's the deep philosophical stuff takes a while. <laughs> the R doesn't take as long, but the deep philosophical stuff does. Cool. Oh, there's all right. Was that? Uh, Inger Marie. She's a colleague of, our, of ours. Yeah, hi, Inger. I know Inger, and, and I think that's that Josie who worked uh, with Ecosystems West years ago and with us uh, for a little bit with Burleson. Uh, yep, that's me. Hi, hi Josie. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Sean? Doing well. Good. Nice to see your, uh, your name on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Inger Marie told me about it. I'm glad I watched it. It's cool. Great information. Yeah. He's being all quiet over there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, adios. All right, good stuff. All right, guys, we'll probably wrap it up. Thanks again, Robert and Robert and Thor and Jackie, you. Steph, everyone, thank you for joining. Um, thanks, Andrew, down there, and Sarah, yeah. board members. So, Thanks for yeah. putting this on, Sean, and thanks for presenting, Robert. Thank you. Thank yeah, you all. So nice team effort for the board. It was a lot of fun. So thanks, Robert. Really Cheers. appreciate it. Yeah, so this is a salamander wine from Aptos. I thought it's I was kidding. What's the winery name? It's technically Salamandre. Okay. I think that's uh, French for salamander. <laughs> that are that's also that's also fire salamanders, right? Salamander salamandry is the <laughs> species name for the. Yeah, Common. it's a. Uh, yep. I actually, I got this at the Corlitos, uh, Corlitos Market in in uh, Corlitos, which is near Freedom, near Watsonville. Doing, a, I was doing biological monitoring up there for a project, and I just stopped by, just check it out, get some lunch, and I, I saw this bottle for the first time like six months ago, and I knew I would have a really good reason to buy it. Actually, I had like seventy reasons to buy it, but. I thought tonight would be a good good opportunity. So now you were able to concentrate on a bottle of wine with that meat market in the back of Corlita's. Oh, market. trust me, oh. I did not just get the bottle of wine, my friend. Oh, have you the, been there, oh. Robert? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you have. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, um, the, 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the tri. Sorry, any vegetarians and vegan, but the, this is the, this is a meat mecca. <laughs> And it's, it's smoky all in there and it wouldn't, oh my gosh. Yeah, the tri-tip sandwich was really tasty for, you know, on the project site. It's mm -hmm. pop in there for lunch, take it back and, oh, 
but it turns out some of the founders of that town are Bradleys, and that's from my grandmother's side of the family. A lot of our, a lot of her cousins, Bradley School Elementary School, right there. Different different Bradleys all through there is part of our family. <laughs> but the Corley is Mark. Oh, awesome, good stuff. All right, I think we should wrap it up, guys. Everyone have a great night. A lot of fun. See ya. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. Where are we gonna post this, uh, Jackie and Steph? Where uh, website, right? Yeah, on our website, on the on our website, chapter website, right, Jackie? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. So we'll Sean, figure it out. <laughs> um, this will probably be safe to your computer. Uh, just a heads up. So you know, after you end the meeting, since I think you started it, if it's if it comes to me, that's no big deal. I'll save it. Otherwise, yeah, we'll I don't remember pressing the recording button, but. It's <laughs> I know it's recording. Oh. I don't know if it's on my computer or not. So, okay, it might be. It might. It might come to mind. I'm just saying, check out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I'll see. It. I'll know right away if it's on mine. It has the little like uploading bar. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Buddy, Thank bye. you, guys. Oh, I see a cat. What's your cat's name, Steph? Oliver. Oliver. <laughs> All right. All right. Like bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. See you later.